And how long does it take for the microbiome to change once someone decides, I'm going to change, for example, my diet, or I'm going to stop using this antiseptic, or I've just done a run of antibiotics. And then, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe one, one I'm sure is antibiotics probably is much harsher than maybe a, McDonald's, a hamburger. I don't know. But uh, can you explain a little bit about what we can do to get a good microbiome? How, how fast does it, does it change? Sure. And you're absolutely right. Antibiotics are going to be a lot more deleterious than a cheeseburger. A typical broad spectrum antibiotic of the type you may take to, to treat, for example, a urinary tract infection or a sinus infection can remove up to a third of your gut bacteria. And that's no simple matter of just, oh, I'm going to just go take a probiotic and then I'm good. I like to use the analogy. It's like draining out your bathtub completely empty and then pouring in a cup of water and saying, okay, you know, I've, I'm good. So they're really, antibiotics are designed to kill bacteria. That's what they do. That's their only job. And so you are always going to take a hit from taking an antibiotic. But if you have not taken a lot of antibiotics in the past or a lot of other microbiome disrupting drugs like acid blockers, steroids, et cetera, if you eat a healthy diet, if you've you know, had good exposure to nature, et cetera, you might be okay with a course of antibiotics. Somebody on the other hand, who's been on antibiotics for prolonged periods of time, maybe doesn't eat a great diet, et cetera. So it really depends on what your overall terrain looks like. But, um, so antibiotics can be tricky because, you know, it's cumulative and it never completely goes back to what it was. In terms of diet, we have a great study that was published in the journal Nature, in 2014. And that study looked at nine volunteers and they put them on an Atkins type pork rinds prosciutto diet. I kid you not, pork rinds for snack. Yes. They put them on that diet and they looked at the microbiome before, during, and after. And then they rested those same nine volunteers for about five days and they put them on a plant-based diet. Jasmine rice, lentils, I believe it was mango for snack instead of the pork rinds. And what they found is that not only did the microbes change dramatically within about 30 hours, so somewhere around a day and a half, but they saw different genes turned on and off too as a result of the dietary changes. So some of the microbial changes we can see when we start to eat more fiber and more plants is that the bilophilia, the bile-loving bacteria will drop. And those are the bacteria that are involved in breaking down meat products. And unfortunately, some of them are also associated with inflammation, diarrheal disease, et cetera. And then we'll see bacteria like Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, that's one of the good guys, that helps to ferment that plant fiber and produce a healthy short-chain fatty acids. Those levels will rise. And again, that's about a day and a half. So, I mean, it's so mm -hmm. optimistic, right? It's not like, okay, I got this bad genetic hand and I you know, have all this disease in my family. Like... We know the genes are just a suggestion. They're not what determines ultimately disease expression. It's these epigenetic factors like our diet, our environment, et cetera. And we have a great deal of control over it. So to me, to be able to tell somebody that, you know, in 30 hours, you can be on your way to improving your microbiome is, I mean, it's incredible. Mm. Will we ever get to a point where we create like um, intelligent medicine, uh, intelligent antibiotics that are we're able to take and they are able to target only the bad bacteria and not the good bacteria? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I, I, I don't, Stop no. That dream. Okay. I don't because it is, you know, there are, first of all, there are as yet hundreds, if not thousands of undiscovered species. Mm. So... And, you know, different strains and so on. So, and there's so much crossover and it's not just a bacteria itself. It's also what we call the postbiotic, the metabolite. It's what the bacteria is actually making mm -hmm. and that can switch. And Dossie, I guess the best example I would give is to say, everybody who is a good person, raise your left hand. Mm. <laughs> everybody who is sometimes a bad person, raise your right hand. <laughs> You know, so it's like saying we're going to kill all the good, all the bad people in the population. Uh, I mean, there are some people in the population who clearly, right. 
you know, just a few. <laughs> maybe they don't deserve to be here, right? They are wreaking havoc. I won't name names. <laughs> right. But there, you know, and then there are other people who are literally, you know, deserve sainthood. But most of us are somewhere in the middle, so, right? We're right. like, yeah. and bacteria are kind of like that too. Like so that a analogy. lot of what, a lot of what we're dealing with is this concept of pathobionts rather than pathogens. So a pathogen, like Ebola is a pathogen. There's nothing good about Ebola. You know, you do not want, or, you know, methicillin resistant staph aureus, flesh eating bacteria. These are bad dudes. But symbionts are bacteria that live very peacefully with us and sometimes even contribute to our health. So what we're seeing a lot of the time, it's not that we are invaded by pathogens. It is that there is imbalance, disruption. So think of a yeast infection, a vaginal yeast infection. You take one too many antibiotics, all of a sudden you've got a creamy white discharge, you're itching, you have a yeast infection. Yeast are not the bad guys here. We have candida in our body. It is an essential part of digestion. Candida are part of the normal flora in the vaginal microbiome. But what happens is when you kill off a lot of the healthy vaginal lactobacillus with the antibiotics, now the candida start to overgrow. And now you have a problem. But if you approach this as, okay, I'm going to go on a scorched earth mission to destroy every yeast in the body, you're not going to end up at a very good place because you're missing the main problem, which is the main problem is you're missing the healthy microbes. You've killed off too many of those. Mm -hmm. So the focus really, we, we really need to focus on repopulation and not repopulation with a store-bought probiotic, repopulation with our own innate gut bacteria by feeding them differently. And I think, you know, Dotsie, to sort of give you a roundabout answer to your question, I don't think, I mean, we have more narrow spectrum antibiotics. Penicillin is going to be a better choice than like a cephalosporin that's more broad spectrum. Mm. But the problem is because of increasing antibiotic resistance, because we have so overused these antibiotics, and remember 80% of them are used in the food industry primarily right. to feed animals. We have such wide spec wide resistance to these, with these resistant superbugs, our antibiotics increasingly each year are more and more potent. So we're kind of moving in the opposite direction where they're, you know, they're killing off everything because there's so much resistance. But here's where I think we may be moving, which is how, could we take bacteria in our gut, take them out, and then somehow like really replicate and magnify them and then put them back in? our own gut bacteria in some way. And of course, one way to do that is to just eat more plant fiber. But of course, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> Everybody wants the high tech, right? Nobody's like, oh, you could have a green smoothie, have a salad for lunch, eat some rice and beans. No, no, I want to go buy the product and take it and have it do that. So no matter, I mean, even if you borrowed a bunch of Fecalobacterium prosnitzii from your plant eating friend, and I injected it up into your colon. If you are then feeding them Cheetos and cheeseburgers, you're not going to get meaningful. You can't get away from the food. You can't get away from the fact that to have a healthy population there, you absolutely have to feed them the right food. So that's where the consistency comes from that you talked about from James Clear's book. Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a lot, you know, just a little bit. Like I, I have a little rule with my patients. I call it the one, two, three rule. One vegetable in the morning, two at lunch, three at dinner. I like to flip it because I like to do a green smoothie in the morning. So I just throw mm -hmm. a bunch in there and then I'm like, okay, I'm already five in. I'm good. But, you know, I remind them like it can be a carrot in your back pocket as you're walking out the door. It doesn't, you know, it can be a handful of spinach just sort of folded into something. It doesn't have to be like an enormous salad at every meal. And we know, again, from that American Gut Project data you're also getting credit for the nuts, the spices, the herbs, all of it.